clarify some terms, Michael. Could you um, explain to us what private means in the context of diplomacy and who are typical private actors? Well, I guess there's a whole, thank you, Serena. Thank you, first of all, it's very good to be here. Um, and thank you for that very nice introduction. And um, hello to everyone on Zoom. Um, uh, pri private diplomacy is a term that I rather like to describe um, what people who are not officials uh, and don't represent governments uh, try to do uh, in terms of the core function of diplomacy, which is to uh, engage, um, to have uh, discussions or dialogues, uh, to smooth the way to um, peaceful uh, outcomes. Um, obviously, you know, you could talk about a whole other function of democracy, which is to, um, to help countries represent their interests. We, you know, we obviously don't get involved in a private way in doing that. And, and there are other organizations that do that. Um, the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, which was established about 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago as a private foundation based in Geneva, essentially came about as a result of a number of former UN officials who were frustrated with the lack of coordination um, in humanitarian field. Um, and we very quickly got diverted to um, looking at mediation and armed conflict because it was at precisely that time that the, um, the UN's functions of, of helping to resolve conflict through its good offices were being challenged um, by the growing complexity of conflict. Um, now, statistically, conflict may over time have has been going down um, in terms of interstate uh, conflicts since the end of the Second World War and the end of the Cold War. But of course, conflicts of, in a variety of forms, particularly internal conflicts, uh, national level conflicts, um, and now this rather sort of complicated um, you know, subnational or national level conflict that's fueled by outside proxies um, has been, I think, very challenging for governments to deal with and, and for the UN system to deal with. And so organizations, and we're not alone, I mean, there are many of us now. Uh, when I first joined HD 15, 16 years ago, there were very few. And now there are, there are quite a few organizations that specialize in what I would call private diplomacy. And the basic function is to use the tools of dialogue and mediation um, as a private actor uh, to bring about the same result, which is uh, some sort of agreement uh, or common understanding um, to reduce levels of violence and bring about peace. And uh, how do we have to imagine this? Uh, is there a lot of coordination with official levels or official channels between the private sectors or are there like typical cases and, um, and where your expertise lies? It's evolved over the years. Traditionally, if you go back 20, 15 years or so, um, the governments or the, would say to an individual, you know, we would like you to help in this situation and we give you a mandate to do so. Mm. Um, and so famously, um, you had, uh, in the case of uh, um, Indonesia, you know, Marty Atisari, the former president of Finland, was asked to uh, by the government to, to, to do this. And the same with HD in the old days, we would be asked by the governments um, and be given a mandate. And that's still very much the case in some parts of the world where it's still rather sort of old fashioned bureaucracy. Um, where you know, a government will send you a letter and saying, we're hereby asking you to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and you would show that letter to the other side and say, you know, we have a mandate. Um, things have become a little bit more complex since then. Um, in some parts of the world, no one quite wants to put things on paper. Mm -hmm. um, no, you know, you, a lot of the way we operate is in situations where it could be deniable. Um, and I think also, um, 
the entry points have become much more complicated now. And so you get pulled into things or you yourself might, as an organization, might want to explore whether or not you can be useful even before you're asked. Mm. Um, so I think it's all become a bit of a blur in terms of the, in terms of the, the mechanics of how you get asked to do things and, and what sort of bona fides that you have. And I think also as organizations have become well known you know, it's sort of no longer required for a government to give you a kind of uh, a seal of approval. Mm. Um, but yes, technically, the parties themselves that you're dealing with have to agree for you to do what you, you know, what you're doing. Um, it's just that sometimes they want that done very quietly mm. um, and not transmitted very widely. To maybe go to a concrete example, which is uh, transmitted quite publicly, um, you're currently doing a podcast called the US-China Conversation. Um, could you maybe explain um, how, how it came about and, and what your aim is with the podcast? Well, th this of course leads us into the current environment that we're in, um, where you know, all track one diplomacy and all diplomacy of any kind really has come to a shuddering halt. Um, because people simply can't meet face to face. Mm. And so as you are aware, um, people have moved initially to this sort of online format, um, convening conferences online. And that works up to a point. It keeps people engaged um, in, in conversations. But it, what it does not substitute for is, is face to face negotiations on anything. Um, and, and so it's really difficult to persuade people to meet online to discuss sensitive issues, especially if they're being asked to agree uh, on how to resolve them. It's simply not happening at any level anywhere. Um, in my part of the world, in Asia, you know, diplomacy has just evaporated. Okay. Um, the, the online summits that are held are essentially hurried affairs where government officials go and read something and leave. Mm. You know, they, they just, they're very uncomfortable with this, with this format. And so um, what we found was that in the, in the initial two or three months of the crisis of the pandemic, people were very reluctant to do anything at all. Mm. Um, but of course, it soon became very evident that, you know, you have to do something, you have to stay in a conversation, otherwise we'll just, you know, uh, levels of mistrust will, will, will go very high and we won't understand the risks of, of, of what we're, you know, what we're doing. And people are, continue to do things on the ground. Um, and it was interesting in the US-China context where we have been working for the last couple of years on issues of risk management in the security field. Um, we initially pulled together a group of Americans and Chinese thinking that, well, we have to continue. And what was interesting is that they felt that in, in the face of this worsening and deterioration of the relationship between the two countries, they somehow needed to do something. And since they can't meet in a substantive way to reduce tensions and build trust, it was felt that maybe they should say things publicly um, together which I thought was, and I'm a journalist, and I was thinking, oh, that's a bit strange. Why would you want to do that? Um, because uh, they just felt that there was just no impact of other voices calling for a more reasoned, cautious approach. Mm. So the initial idea was that why don't we write, jointly write articles together that get published? And we thought that was a bad idea because you can imagine the sort of editing job of, you know, the US and a Chinese um, commentator you know pulling them together and then agreeing on what would be said in yeah. print so we had the idea of doing a podcast because that could be managed it's a conversation that can be managed it's also a form of dialogue mm -hmm. and it turned out to be a useful platform because it's not a it's not as public as you think it would be you know it's not broadcast you have to choose to listen to a podcast you have to commit 25 minutes of your time and so yes it's out there in public but it's actually selective um, and we thought that if it could be a moderated discussion, like we moderate dialogues, um, then it may be useful because you could tease out areas of common ground 
Uh, and so that's why we embarked on that. Um, and it's been, you know, it's had a very good reaction. Not many people, there's been a lot of, obviously, podcasts have become a very um, popular form of a medium in, in, during the pandemic. But it tends to be one side saying one thing and the other side saying another thing, but bringing them together on the same platform was not so common. <coughs> and since you've started, there's three episodes out now. Yeah, we're waiting till after the election to do more uh -huh. because many of the discussions that you hold now on this issue of the US and China mostly revolve around, well, we'll see what happens after the 3rd of mm -hmm. November. So we'll, have, we'll see what happens after the 3rd of November. And, but do you see like people preparing for the different scenarios that we're facing after the election in the US? Or is there a way for diplomatic actors to prepare in the current situation? It's a really good question. I think the answer is no, mm. um, because it's a bit like the, the old story about the sky is falling. So everyone's looking at the sky falling and not really thinking about what's going to happen the next day. Mm. Um, so I think it's, it's actually a, it's a very good question. I don't see people preparing for scenarios. I mean, it's partly because no one can decide you know, uh, what, you know, on, it was, the outcome is so uncertain. Um, and, you know, we know that uh, broadly speaking, there will be more opportunities for diplomacy and dialogue. Um, you know, if, if, the, if, if Joe Biden wins the election and there'll be a return to some kind of, not a complete status quo, but, you know, something like it. But, what, but it's, you know, it's a completely unknown landscape if the, if the other scenario plays out. Um, and I think also many countries don't want to necessarily reveal how they would react or what they would do. Um, and so you're right. I mean, it's, it's a very good question, but it's very, very hard to play out those scenarios. People are not willing to talk about them. Mm. I do think that one thing that's important is there, there are three, in this sort of post-pandemic or pandemic, um, environment, there are three certainties. The, the one is that, um, you know, as long as, as long as there are restrictions on on face-to-face -face meetings, there is no effective diplomacy. Um, and, you know, the president of France or, uh, you know, he can travel around and, 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 and try to sort of posture the need for action in, 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 in one place or another. But the follow-up to that sort of you know high profile visit to Lebanon or uh, you know, um, sending fighters over the Eastern Mediterranean or you know the follow up is is simply not practical because officials are simply not meeting hmm. um, and in Asia it gets worse because borders are so firmly shut the only foreign minister in Southeast Asia who's traveled is the Indonesian foreign minister who made a visit to China and to the Middle East and then to Singapore. And she had to use COVID-19 as a cover, you know, like I'm going to talk to China about vaccines. I'm going to talk about business travel. You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult for officials to, to justify uh, talking about geopolitical or other issues unrelated to, to COVID-19. So that's the first. I think the second important change is that obviously what, wh whoever wins that election on 3rd of November is, is, is going to be dealing with a situation where the US is no longer perceived uh, in the same way as it was, you know, two or three or five years ago um, before 2016. Um, and that's a reality we have to deal with. Um, and then I think thirdly, it's very important for us to recognize now that there are huge... Um, factors, uh, additional factors that affect diplomacy that traditionally have not been part of the calculation. Public health, obviously, um, the environment, climate change, 70 million refugees who, know, who don't have a say in anything. So these are all things that I think will, ch will start to change the discourse or should change the discourse. Um, and then I think that leads to one possibility, which is that you have new constellations of mid-sized powers of countries that, that want to take initiatives um, that, that try to accept these new realities. And one of these initiatives will somehow succeed or you know, uh, uh, gain some traction. We haven't seen it yet though. I mean, it's still too difficult. Um, you know, we see Germany trying very hard 
to uh, to take initiatives, particularly in, in peacemaking. We see the French, you know, trying to sort of fill that gap um, left by the US. Uh, we see the EU, you know, uh, struggling to sort of, to, it's always struggled to have a policy on anything, but, you know, still struggling. And, and then, at, of course, in, in Asia, you see, uh, you know, China, you know, really uh, failing perhaps to take advantage of those huge gaps in terms of global leadership um, and worried more about competition with, with the US. So it's, it, the, the, the landscape is very uncertain. You live in Singapore and um, in a region that is at ha that had to accustom itself to the reality of the competition between China and the US for a while now. And you said it yourself, the EU or Europe and Switzerland, we're facing more and more um, this reality. Like we haven't felt it so as much as Southeast Asia or Asia before. Is there anything you can uh, recommend these countries for to to prepare their, themselves for this new reality? Well, you know, the Asian and European context is so very different um, because the reactions to the public health crisis have been, you know, um, black and white difference. You know, Europe's borders have remained open for the most part. Uh, discourse, you know, face-to-face -face discourse in Europe, you know, at a government level does continue. Um, there was a brief interruption, but it, you know, uh, Brussels functions, people, people meet. Um, in Europe, in, in Asia, that's simply not happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I could technically travel to China, but no one would meet with me. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, 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 I did a, a video call with the Singapore Foreign Ministry earlier this week where it made no difference where I was because I couldn't have gone to their offices yeah. and they're all working from home. So, so the, the situation is just so much more closed um, in Asia. Now, of course, this does also present an opportunity for those countries like Indonesia and, and, uh, and others who, who do want to take initiatives. Um, because they're going to have to make the first move. They, that means people will have to start traveling and having face-to-face -face meetings. Um, you know, we're seeing a crisis at the moment uh, uh, in, in, along the border between Bangladesh and, and Myanmar, because as, as everyone is aware, you have you know, a million Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. There's an awful lot of pressure from Bangladesh to expel them across the border. You now have both militaries, ri rising tensions between both militaries, um, over this issue. And now, just recently, you have calls on major powers to get involved. India's, the Indians are going to visit uh, Myanmar to put pressure um, you know, on, uh, on Bangladesh. Um, and the, the, the Bangladesh has meanwhile called for China to be involved. So you know, geopolitics doesn't stop. Mm. Um, and, and in many ways, what we're seeing is a situation where the normal avenues to resolving these tensions are closed because who's going to get involved mm. to sort of try and prevent that from uh, spilling over? And we, mm. as an organization, we have our limitations in that respect. I mean, you can't, we, we do bring together people to, to create and, 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 and channels of communication that otherwise wouldn't exist. But there's a limit to how far um, you can go with, with preventing, say, two countries from going to war. Um, you know, if you don't get other powers or the United Nations or, um, you know, uh, a, a constellation of powers together to prevent that from happening. And what's not working at the moment is getting people's attention. Um, because who wants to look at, you know, the Rohingya crisis when every one of these countries has their own public health crisis? Um, so it's, it really makes it very much more complicated. Mm. And are, are you expecting new like uh, alliances to form? You said like there's an opportunity here for for like middle powers. Yeah, so I think so. I think so. I I think you know countries like Canada, Germany, um, Indonesia, Japan, uh, Korea, South Korea. I think there's a sort of dim awareness of the need to sort of come together, but everyone's afraid. No one is used to acting without the United States or acting without the United Nations or acting, 
you know, without larger powers in support. And it, it's almost like they're kind of newborn infants trying to sort of walk, you know, so well, but we're not going to be, we're not going to get help from others. We have to do it ourselves. Um, you know, Canada's tried to, to take initiatives, for instance, on public health uh, that sort of try to stand out from the others. Uh, Germany is investing huge amounts of money in, in sort of peacemaking now. Uh, but again, not, not, very, not taking a very forward position themselves. Um, and so it's all very tentative at the moment. And I, I think one thing to watch in the coming year will, of course, be um, what people start to do around climate change. You know, once people can stop thinking about public health for a moment, I think they're going to very quickly turn back to climate change because we've seen some you know, very, very severe impacts um, globally. And it will be interesting to see what replaces the whole Paris framework. Mm. Um, or if, you know, middle-sized powers in Europe and elsewhere come together again in a new constellation. And that would be encouraging. So you say that this could be the, the next, like, excuse for people to actually travel, although borders might still be closed. Well, we have to get back to, mm. we really do have to get back to face-to-face -face interaction mm. on critical issues, whether it's security or... Uh, now, I mean, again, for a private organization, we can prepare the ground, we can, we can keep conversations going to prepare for a time when that is possible. Um, but unless we had a fleet of private jets to go to a place where miraculously there was absolutely no threat of infection of any kind, Yeah. And where people, I mean, it, it, it's just all too difficult to imagine at this point. Um, it's interesting. I think in, in the business sector, people are really going back to travel mm -hmm. when people can afford to use their own forms of transport and have high level meetings uh, under controlled situations. That's beginning to happen. Um, but for public officials, of course, the difficulty is the responsibility that they face when they criticize for going from one place to another. Um, you know, we've seen numbers of politicians who've been criticized for appearing in meetings without masks, for yeah. instance. It's very much more difficult for, for public officials um, to sort of change the way things are at the moment without being criticized. Um, and so I think, you know, we're still stuck in that. Um, we have been able to, to bring processes forward um, where we've been able to move people with, say, the permission of the Swiss government, for instance, to make exemptions. Um, but that's, you know, that's risky, you know, uh, that, that can itself cause problems. So we have to be very careful about how we begin to convene people again. Um, before we open up for uh, questions here in the room and also via the Q&A function, I would like to do like a short tour the conflict uh, through Asia and maybe your take on, on civil society and the role uh, it could play in resolving conflicts that are currently maybe at hold or still lingering on despite uh, without attention. Um, well, I already mentioned the, yeah. the, the more serious one at the moment in, in, in Asia is, <clears throat> at least on, the, on a field level, is, is between Myanmar and Bangladesh at the moment. There is a very real risk of conflict now between those two countries. Um, over this issue um, and, you know, a great deal of fragility on either side of the border because you have internal conflicts in Rakhine State bordering Myanmar and then you have the refugee problem on the other side of the border. So it's, a, it's, it's the primary example of where, you know, internal conflict, humanitarian crisis and geopolitics is intersecting at the moment and that's a very serious situation. Um, All the internal conflicts uh, across Southeast Asia um, have more or less continued. All the processes to try and resolve them have been uh, rather paralyzed by the inability to bring people together because it involves moving people across borders. Um, so that's actually a pretty bad situation. Mm. Um, in the countries themselves where you have interstate issues like in the South China Sea, it's also been uh, very difficult because uh, there's been no substantive negotiations between China and the Southeast Asian countries uh, on a code of conduct. Nothing, nothing has moved for 10 months. Um, 
and there's been a huge loss of trust as a result. Um, and of course, in the vacuum, people have behaved badly on the ground or at sea. Um, and not just China in the South China Sea, but also claimant states among themselves. And so there's been a buildup of tension between states as a result, because you simply haven't had um, the sort of diplomatic level discussions to try and reduce those tensions. Um, I think also there's a, a degree of concern in, in the ASEAN region about the cohesion between the different countries because there hasn't been normal diplomatic discourse. Lots of migrant workers have been sent home from one country to another. This, this process was handled <clears throat> very badly. Um, there's a lot of bad blood now between countries. Why did you send all my people home? Why, you know, why were they treated so badly? Okay. Um, uh, and I think um, there's a concern about what will happen when things do get back to normal, that there'll, there'll have been this, this great breach of, of, of a lot of trust that's been built up over the years, and that will have to be rebuilt. Um, and then I think in terms of, uh, you know, you have the Korean Peninsula where Kim Jong-un has had, you know, been able to basically do whatever he wants in terms of testing. Uh, so there's a great deal of concern that in, in, the, in the last year or so, um, things have moved backwards on the Korean Peninsula. Um, there's no effective diplomacy there either. Um, obviously, China's uh, uh, approach to the region and, and to the world in this period um, has been affected by two things. First of all, um, they very quickly recovered from COVID and their economy is more or less back to normal. Um, and, but they haven't used this opportunity yet to sort of try and help other countries beyond the sort of medical supplies. But in terms of economic aid, in terms of investment, in terms of uh, using China's you know, economic resilience uh, to help the rest of the region, we haven't seen a sign of that yet. But I think that's also because the, the, the major impact on China over the last several months has been the increasing uh, tension between the US and China, uh, which as it has become more ideological, has driven China to be, to be more defensive and shrill and, and rather um, counterproductive in its own, in its own right. Um, so that remains probably the, the principal driver of conflict in the region at the moment, the US-China tension. When you say yet, uh, do you expect that to change? And is uh, Xi's speech at the UN maybe a sign for China getting back into the track of multilateralism and stepping up in global governance? Well, I mean, I think that's always been there. You know, for the, for the last five years, you know, there has been a strand of Chinese policy that, that wants to play a bigger role in global governance and rule setting um, in the field of artificial intelligence, for example. Um, but the counterpoint to that has been this increasing defensiveness, um, partly driven by domestic factors in China. Um, you know, it's clear that Xi Jinping is demanding uh, a much uh, less, much more um, loyalty to the Communist Party and to the, the and, and also to his leadership. Um, at the same time that the US has started to attack the Communist Party directly, has made it very difficult for the Chinese to do that sort of, well, we've got our internal issues and then we deal with the outside world you know, in, in, in a sort of more um, objective way. They see the two as aligned now. It's, it's like these are attacks on the Chinese Communist Party and therefore it makes it difficult for China to, uh, to, to have that, a different kind of conversation about external issues. So yes, you would think that that would be the logical way to go. Um, but at the same time, with the tension between the US and China, putting so much pressure uh, on China because they sense that they're being contained, that there's that there's there's going to be opposition to whatever role they want to play. It's just becoming unless we can resolve that issue, I think it's very difficult to expect the Chinese to, if you like, walk and chew gum at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a shame because there are huge opportunities for China there which they're not taking, uh, and in fact, they're building up huge levels of mistrust as mm -hmm. well in the rest of the region and the world. What would you hope for China to do next? Well, I, you know, if, if 
the, the immediate problem next year for everyone is going to be economic crisis um, and huge levels of unemployment um, and you know national level crisis as well if, if, if issues aren't addressed. Um, China's in a very good position with its economy recovering to actually play a role in helping to stabilize. Um, now that's going to be questioned again by many Western countries in the US as peddling their influence. And so the normal process by which countries who are better off help those that are less better off is going to be complicated by geopolitics.